good morning last few classes we have been talking about some of the application principles of physical metallurgy that we have learned and we did talk about that most of the metals that we use they are made up of uh, several crystals and these crystals in most cases are randomly oriented but in certain cases it is quite possible that these crystals are oriented in a preferred manner in that case we get certain very specific properties or characteristics and it is possible to exploit this characteristic in several uh, applications and we will see some of these and in under this under this uh, topic that preferred orientation that application what we will look at if crystals are not randomly oriented then it is likely that the properties will be not be same along all direction of the product we will also look at how do you get this kind of preferred orientation one way is the process of directional solidification when you solidify or uh, solidification process the crystals grow preferentially along particular direction for example in cubic crystals particularly bulk of the alloy that we use is a face centered cubic and many of these cases it is the cube direction along which the growth rate is maximum so therefore it is quite easy to produce crystals having this kind of texture or this type of preferred orientation we can also produce preferred orientation by cold working we have seen that when you deform a material the process of deformation is primarily through slip and slip is a process of simple shear so there is some amount of rotation associated with it and during the deformation crystals orientation change and finally the cold work material when you recrystallize you may get another type of uh, preferred structure we will look at uh, whether uh, alloy additions or uh, uh, or the factors which that control uh, this uh, kind of preferred orientation that you get here we will talk about few applications one related to super alloy we will also talk about some application where uh, uh, making sheet product which are sheet products are made by deep drawing how to get a good formability so that they can be easily deep drawn and with minimum amount of rejection and we will also talk about some applications in electrical steel where when do we need preferred orientation and when we do not need preferred orientation and how we can uh, production route can be modified to achieve this objective now uh, if we look at uh, the origin of anisotropy so in general the crystals have some symmetry elements in fact the cubic crystal they have maximum symmetry elements cubic crystal have some finite number of symmetry element even cubic crystal which has maximum a uh, number of symmetry element have different properties along different directions so this is uh, i think we did talk about in detail and we have seen if we look at bulk of the cases um, we look at mechanical properties and which were elastic constant and this is determined mechanical properties are determined by elastic constants and we have seen that in case of cubic crystal you need three elastic constants whereas for isotropic material it is good enough to have two and usually this elastic constant for isotropic material is one is a young's modulus another we can take uh, uh, either one of the two so very often we use poisson ratio as the other elastic constant and if these two are known the shear modulus can easily be found out and in fact for isotropic material uh, so we have we did uh, introduce this concepts of stiffness 
and compliance, they are actually tensor. We looked at its nature and what does uh, this signify is if we look at here that C signifies it, it, it defines a relationship between stress and strain. So, if, if we say that if we want to find out stress along a particular direction and then we see this is C i j epsilon j, where sigma 1, 2, 3, 4 is up to 6. These are this defines the stress state epsilon 1, 2 that is epsilon 1, epsilon 2 up to 6 that i or j they vary from 1 to 6. This is the range and repeat a suffix means summation. So, you can imagine you have a large number of these constants and, uh, and there are certain uh, symmetry rules uh, which you can apply like stress is a symmetric tensor. So, similarly strain also we can uh, assume that th this also is a symmetric tensor. So, you do not have I mean you have certain limited number of elastic constant and crystal having least symmetry element where we have 21 elastic constants. So, this is just a recapitulation of what has been done. Similarly, uh, instead of you can uh, define strain also in the same way this is S i j now uh, it is possible to show if you look at uh, this uh, slide over here it is possible to see, uh, you look at how these constants are related in case of an isotropic material in cubic this relation will not be valid the c44 will not be given by uh, this um, uh, these two. So, therefore, uh, what we need in case of a cubic crystal three elastic constants C 4 4, C 1 1, C 1 2 or S 4 4, S 1 1, S 1 2. However, uh, if you look at uh, this elastic constant of tungsten, this is an ideal isotropic material even a single crystal tungsten will satisfy this type of relationship. So, therefore, one point that you can infer that polycrystals which is made up of several or large number of crystals. So, in a fine grain you will have a very large number of crystals per unit volume. So, it is more likely that if finer the grain it is more likely the property will be isotropic. However, orientation is rarely random and what do we uh, 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 what will happen if the orientation is not random obvious thing is say you may need I mean the properties will be anisotropic. Now, let us see the origin of anisotropy why do we get anisotropy in a material there are two kinds of anisotropy one is a crystallographic anisotropy metals are made up of uh, have crystalline structure even in polycrystalline material uh, they may be if crystals are oriented in a preferred manner then polycrystalline material will also show that crystallographic type of anisotropy and sometime we call this crystal uh, this crystallographic text uh, arrangement as a texture this has a certain preferred orientation or texture and then it will have different properties in different direction another uh, reason for anisotropic behavior of the material and a polycrystalline material is many cases we have seen that the metals are not uh, I mean they are often um, not made up of single phase. There are certain amount of unintentional um, uh, phases which are present like inclusions and sometimes some of these inclusions like manganese sulfide in steel uh, they change their shape they get elongated during the plastic deformation or thermomechanical processing stage. So, in the material you will have this elongated manganese sulfide along the rolling directions. So, therefore, you have that 
arrangement, the macroscopic arrangement, microscopic arrangement, different phases, they for have a certain pattern and which will make the property anisotropic. Now, let us see why does this type of anisotropic crystallographic anisotropy develop in a uh, material and what are the factors which will determine. Obviously, deformation um, uh, uh, is determined uh, by but primarily by slip and twinning, these are the two modes of deformation, but bulk of the deformation in metals they are through slip. Now, if you have a different crystal structure, it will affect uh, the texture that you get. It will also determine by the process of uh, deformation that you are giving. If this is being drawn, in that case you have one kind of effect. If it is uh, being uh, rolled, then you have another kind of effect. And if you recollect the drawing, so drawing is uh, you, you have a die, you have a die and die like this and your product, you know this is your sample and you try to pull it through the die. So, you have reduction. So, this is your initial cross section after drawing this reduces to this. So, that means there is deformation in this direction and every in this directions there is a diameter reduces and the length increases. So, you, you can say that drawing is a process where you have two directions you have um, reductions and another direction you have elongation. And we also assume that volume does not change during deformation. So, this is one difference whereas, in case of a rolling if you recollect you have a slab passing through and you have a reduction in thickness. The thickness reduces, so this is the initial thickness before rolling and after rolling this is the thickness. So, there is a reduction in one direction and elongation in this direction and the other direction perpendicular here there is a negligible deformation. So, you can say this is a plane strain deformation whereas, in this particular case uh, you can see this is uh, uh, you have strain in three directions. So, that is the basic difference <coughs> and because this <coughs> excuse me state of <coughs> excuse me because the state of stresses are different you get different types of texture and which is listed over here in case of a drawing and it changes depending on the crystal structure. A rolling you can get one type of preferred orientation whereas, in case of a drawing you get another. Now, this is a typical example which is shown a metal which is made up of several crystals and so these are each grain means one crystal and uh, although in two dimension and figure that we see under microstructure, but these grains are actually a 3 D object and it has a partic prefer particular orientation and we have tried to represent this orientation by this small cube and you, you see in each of these cases the crystals are differently oriented and this can be determined there are different techniques x-ray diffraction technique, <coughs> electron beam uh, electron backscatter. Uh, diffraction pattern that is an this is a special attachment which is attached to scanning electron microscope. By this also you can e explore the extent of an extent of the crystal orientation or textures which is present in the material and you can also measure property along different directions and you will find if the properties elastic modulus you can find in different directions and you will find they are different. So, if so, these are the evidence of crystallographic anisotropy and this reason for this anisotropy is cold work you and if you anneal a cold work material depending on the magnitude of cold work you get a typical annealing texture. And these are also altered by alloy addition and also 
the microstructure also affects the different phases if it is a two phase or, or a microstructure if there are some alloy additions then also they affect that uh, texture that you get in the material during processing. And this is an example of mechanical uh, anisotropy. So, here uh, what we have sh uh, what has been shown that you have a inclusion something here. So, this is a material which has undergone large deformation if you look up here this is a manganese sulphide they get elongated and maybe they, 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 they will get elongated most of the time and after uh, during deformation uh, you know if it is hot working uh, they these grains get recrystallized these are the main grains they get recrystallized let us say this is ferrite this is manganese sulphide. So, these are non metallic inclusions they have a totally different characteristics bonding in this direction is not very good. So, if you measure its mechanical properties along this direction you will find since these are aligned. So, you may find that better strength in this directions, but in this direction these boundaries they are weak and it fractures and sometimes. So, these are and it also causes some problem during welding it uh, results in lamellar tearing. So, mechanical anisotropy origin lies in the microstructure and particular one of these uh, um, uh, factor is the inclusion. And how do you control this uh, mechanical anisotropy or you want to avoid this anisotropy? You can control that amount, so have as little inclusion in the material as possible and also you try to control its shape and size. By controlling shape and size you can try and make the material uh, as isotropic as possible. Now, since the materials uh, have different uh, properties along different direction is a texture hardening is this a possibility. Now, bulk of the metal that you use they are highly symmetric they are BCC or FCC. Say aluminum is face centered cubic steel it is primarily ferrite it is body centered cubic. So, in this case because of that high symmetry element that scope is very limited and if you recollect this relationship that C S stress uh, this is the resolved C S stress and because the deformation takes place through shear on particular slip plane. So, that means if, if you resolve that C S stress on that specific slip plane you know it is the load that is applied this is over cross section area. So, this is the tensile load that you apply to the test specimen, this is the shear stress on the specific slip plane and this is the orientation factor cos phi cos lambda is the orientation factor. So, in a way you can say that ratio of uh, ratio of uh, tensile stress over shear stress this is equal to this 1 over cos phi cos lambda. So, this is the orientation factor we call this as m that is the orientation factor. Now, what will be the minimum value of this? This is minimum when cos phi cos lambda is maximum and we know that this is maximum when phi is equal to this equal to 45 degree. So, therefore, minimum m is this. Now, in case of face centered cubic you have a limited scope for increasing or, or changing this m and if the if it is perfectly random orientation m is around 3.1. Whereas, in H C P metal there is a wider scope. So, if at all you know this texture hardening is to be exploited you have to look for hexagonal closed pack structure and possibly ideal hexagonal closed pack structure. So, there only it is possible say if you want to have a dent resistant material you def def uh, de develop a texture. So, that it is dent resistant that will be possible on if you if the material has hexagonal closed pack structure. So, textures in metal nevertheless affect several other properties and which are worth 
exploiting and we will see the, how this is done. A quick look at the factors that control texture and the material. Obviously, the texture origin of that crystallographic structure we have seen lies in the cold work, the deformations. Now, in alloy say particularly uh, also alloy addition does affect uh, the texture. Say if you cold work copper you would get one kind of texture, brass you get another kind of texture. Origin in fact does lie in, uh, in the slip and the slip we know it takes place through movement of dislocations. Now, if a material when you alloy usually we find that stacking fault energy decreases. So, you have the perfect dislocations they split up into partials and stacking fault energy means low stacking fault energy and large distance between the partial dislocations. So, if the dislocations are split they have little difficulty in slipping in cross slipping. They cannot cross slip, they can move only in one plane. So, you can reason out one reason for uh, why this uh, alloy addition controls the texture is because the movement of dislocations they, they depend significantly on the stacking fault energy. Another reason for uh, this te texture that develop is a recrystallization process. Now, this when recrystallization takes place, recrystallization uh, after recrystallization, rec uh, recrystallization the new grains that they form they are not necessarily randomly oriented, they depend on several factors. One could be the amount of cold work that you have put in. So, already if it is a highly textured material it is likely that recrystallized material also will have a texture. Again, if there are certain inclusion presence some carbon nitrides in steels like if aluminum nitride they, uh, they actually uh, develop a certain kind of preferred orientation. The inclusions or precipitates if they are present in the material they also will control the type of texture that will develop during recrystallization temperature. Uh, during process. Similarly, secondary recrystallization this is the last stage of the recrystallization process when few of the grains um, they start grow abnormally and this happens when this precipitates most of the time this precipitates when they dissolve they are not able to pin the boundary and if such a thing happens you have it you may have a different kind of a texture. In certain cases this is exploited particularly in electrical steels. Now, the question is what happens how do you represent uh, these preferred orientation and we did talk about it pole figure is used to represent the preferred orientations. Now, here what we do actually in a uh, represent it in a kind of a stereographic projection say suppose this is the base circle say this is the rolling direction, this is the transfer directions. And if we if it is a perfect let us say it is a single crystal you have and we are trying to plot this 1 1 1 pole figure. This will be located there will be 4 different 1 1 1 plane and there will be this will be represented by 4 pole. And in fact, if you have large number of such crystals in the material it is very likely that if there are random orientation they will be uniformly distributed all over this. So, if it is uniform that means distribution then it is a random orientation. But what happens when you cold work or something they try to arrange along a particular direction. In that case these are these intensity contours which are plotted the density of poles how many numbers of poles are there. So, instead of they are being located all around they are located at certain isolated uh, places and this is called pole figure and it is schematically I have tried to show this pole figure uh, effect of cold work and rolling. So, this is if you have a 90 percent and 5 percent cold work is a large amount of cold work better is the texture that you develop 
as what happens it is not that I have just tried to show some of the places you have you will have four regions actually uh, uh, where these 111 poles will be located. So, if there is a pole here these are diametrically. So, there also you may get some amount of um, reflections. So, they may be uh, located in certain areas like this like this or maybe it is not as perfect maybe they are located as, as some of these regions it is quite possible. So, this is the type of textures that you get in the pole figure you get in a cold work copper. If it is brass then you find that nature is little different. So, here the brass so possibly it cannot uh, cross slip because of that low stacking fault energy you may find the type of texture that they develops is little different. And when you anneal possibly in this case you get you, you are likely to get a particular type of this is the texture and if you say that this is a something similar to a cube texture, a cube texture. So, that means this rolling direction 100 if you anneal this cold work structure get a different types. I have just schematic uh, you, you should look up that exact textbook to see how uh, uh, what a pole figure looks like. Now, let us see some of the applications. Uh, in certain cases, uh, we know that uh, in to some extent an isotropy is desirable, whereas in certain other cases in undesirable. Now, look at the case of a sheet forming. How do you do sheet forming? You have a blank and from that you are trying to deep draw and make a tumbler like this. This is a cylindrical object and this is a sheet. A disc has been cut and from this disc you want to give it this shape. So, the process is this blank is kept between a die and you push it to a punch and there will be say particular this dimension there may be some clearances are required you may need a little lubrications and when you push it what happens this flows and then the material flow like this when this goes out pushes this material flows like this and finally, uh, you get this type of a structure. And what is done you, it is possible to find out the drawing ratio. This is the diameter of the blank is capital D, diameter of the punch is small d and this ratio is called drawing ratio. And you can try to find out limiting drawing ratio L D R. So, how much you can draw? So, that means uh, initially you, you see that uh, this how large this ratio can be. If it is larger that means it has a good deep drawability. Now, in that case what do we need? So, you need high uniform elongations. There should not be any local deformation. We know in the stress strain diagram uh, the, there is uh, after a certain critical strain local deformation takes place there is necking. So, there should not be any necking, necking to be avoided. So, the material must have high uniform elongation. There should be minimum strain in the thickness directions. Material should flow in this direction only. The deformation should be the planar deformation through thickness there should be minimum strain in the thickness direction. And there should be equal strain along all planar directions. So, in different direction planar direction the strain should be as close as possible. If it is not close in certain direction it flows more or certain direction is flows less say suppose in this direction you get a this kind of a structure which is called earring. And another important thing is there should not be any yield point. Yield point also gives local deformation, luda bands form and which leaves unpleasant marks on the deep drawn product and which customer will not like. So, therefore, uh, and uh, question then comes how do we satisfy this? So, in that case we need to have high plastic strain ratio. We said that what is this plastic strain ratio? 
strain in the width direction, strain in the thickness direction and this should be as low as possible and this should be high. And this is how you determine this, this is the width before uh, deformation, this is the width after deformation. So, what you do? You have a sheet and from this sheet what you do? You try and find out, uh, you make specimens along different orientation. This is aligned along rolling direction, this is along transverse direction, this is at 45 degree angle to rolling directions and this is also at 45, but uh, in a differently oriented. This is oriented like this this is oriented like this. And what you do? You do a tensile test. So, and W is the width and T is the thickness. And when you measure this strain, try to find out true strain, which is different defined as log to the base E natural logarithm of W naught over W. Similarly, this is strain along thickness directions. And often it is a little difficult to find out, you may find that often it is difficult uh, to measure thickness. So, what you do in this particular case, uh, what you do is you try to find out the length and the width, because thickness is uh, it is a normally very thin sheet. If it is a very thin sheet, it is accuracy is less in thickness measurement. And what you do? by volume constancy you can convert, you can know the calculate the thickness and this is what has been done. I leave this to you. So, these are the fine initial dimension, this is the final dimension and this is the expression for plastic strain ratio. And what do you do th uh, when you do the tensile test on differently oriented samples, you get different values. So, this is the value R naught is the value of plastic strain ratio along rolling direction this is R 90 is along transverse directions and this is that 45 di di directions and you have two samples. So, you find out average R bar and what has been found out is this R bar value, this average R bar has a direct correlation with limiting drawing ratio. That means, this explains at uh, this code, it gives a better correlations or is a better indicator of the ability of the material to be deep drawn. So, R bar is a method, R bar is, is the property which uh, gives which is a measure of deep drawability of the material, because most other deformation processes we go by percentage elongation and you will find that even if you do it is erratic, it does not have a direct correlation with L D R. And rimming steels, uh, they have a, re a, a relatively poor R bar. Whereas, in keel steel because of aluminum, uh, presence of aluminum, aluminum nitride, uh, the material during deformation processing develops a preferred structures and this has a high R bar value. So, R bar, R bar has better correlation with the drawability and usually and there are certain extra deep drawing uh, grade steels where even this is uh, goes close to 2. There is another problem we just mentioned that uh, that is a problem of earring. If this deformation not uniform in all direction, so that means what you need here is the material should be anisotropic as far as the thickness direction strength is concerned, but the material should be isotropic as far as this planar uh, deformation is concerned. So, if it is that means it should not form that earring. If, if in certain direction, this is a earring problem. So, if you, if you have to tumbler you are making, obviously, you have to cut it out. So, that means, there is a rejection, this is a waste. So, to cut down the waste, it is necessary the material should have, uh, uh, should not suffer from this type of a earring problem. And this is possible when you find out R along different direction, you find out what is the maximum value of R and what is the minimum and this range is called delta R. So, low delta R means this is the ideal, if this is 0 that is low delta R, this is the ideal material for deep drawing, there is no earring problem. Whereas, if delta R is high, then 
it is likely to have a earring problem. And R bar has a direct correlation with crystal structure and which is given here. For face centered cubic, of course, you cannot get a very high because of that. Uh, whereas in BCC, it has uh, many more slip system and here it is much, uh, it has a better drawability. You can get even R bar as high as 1.8 in aluminum kill steel or even certain extra deep drawing quality steel even higher. And usually here, if you have this kind of a texture, if the rolled surface is close to 100 plane, it has a lowest value. Whereas, if this is parallel to that uh, 111 plane, then it has the highest, uh, deep, uh, highest R bar. Now, the problem of uh, yield point is illustrated here and we know that low carbon steels uh, which are actually the bulk of the steels are low carbon steel and low carbon steel the stress strain diagram if you look at there is an yield point phenomena. So, this is stress this is strain and this is the upper yield point when it exceeds this and there is a serrated yielding here and then it goes like this. So, you have uncontrolled deformation over here and when this happens there are luder bands form on the surface. So, and these luder bands they leave uneven marks on the, the these, these are highly deformed area. So, these marks are uh, quite visible and in fact, this stretcher marks if you get on these uh, you know the product will not sell. So, one way of avoiding is many of these steels um, you know you give a temper rolling maybe 2 percent cold drawn. So, after this you unload and then you know then the stress strain diagram it does not show it is a smooth transition it does not have uh, does not show yield point phenomena. But the problem is uh, you know they are also susceptible to strain aging left to room temperature long time it can reappear and if it reappears then again because of the strain aging again this will have a difficulty to withdraw. So, if a temper rolling is done you have to see that it must be deep drawn within a specified uh, period of time and if that time is exceeded again that kind of temper rolling may be necessary. Another way of avoiding this altogether is not to have any interstitial in the material. Interstitial free steels do not suffer from this yield point problem and also you may ensure that uh, there is no yield point problem. You have some strong carbide former in the material. So, these are the ways by which you can avoid that yield point phenomena. Now, a quick look about uh, we last class we did talk about the creep resistant material we and bulk of these are polycrystalline these are the materials which are used and we have a potential as austenitic steel is also used for as a creep resistant material and as far as steels are concerned this table gives you a comparison of the creep uh, high temper or creep resistance of alloys. Uh, uh, depending on their crystal structure. This is ferritic steel, this is austenitic steel. Of course, you need a one criteria is you must have low creep rate. So, as far as this close pack structure gives lower creep rate. So, here austenitic steel is preferred, but the other you know you, pre, you also want to have low modulus, low thermal coefficient expansion and high thermal conductivity. In that case, the thermal stresses there will be minimum because many of these high temperature materials they, they often subjected to say repeated uh, shutdown then uh, start up and shut down and that is the time you have high thermal stresses. To avoid that uh, you need to have low modulus, low thermal coefficient of expansion, high conductivity. So, here ferritic steel scores over austenitic, but austenitic steel they have a lower creep rate and also they have a better structural stability. Because here if you heat it beyond a particular temperature it again gets converted in austenite. So, that is one limitation of this and there are attempts are on to improve this temperature range or st uh, stability of ferritic steel because it has certain other attractive properties. And if you go to even higher temperature 
then obviously you have to use even better material and nickel based super alloy is another common high temperature creep resistant materials. Now, we did uh, look at uh, uh, the process of uh, uh, the criteria for the selection of materials for creep resistance and one of the uh, mechanism of creep is movement of gli dislocation glide, but this glide is also controlled by climb process, because most of these uh, uh, particularly nickel based material you have a high volume fraction of this precipitate and these precipitates are quite large. So, if you have a dislocation, uh, if you have this dislocation to move, it has to overcome this precipitate and this can do by either by shearing or by avoiding this by through climb. And if you assume that this climbs over it, in that case we have seen last class. Uh, this is uh, the expression if you recollect, then we can make this process of climb difficult by making this uh, larger. That means, if this is larger, it will leave longer time to climb. So, this high T climb means lower creep rate. Similarly, you need to have large volume fraction of precipitate. In that case, uh, you will uh, also large volume uh, uh, and large volume fraction means the smaller distance lambda is the interparticle distance large volume fraction will be smaller uh, interparticle spacing so you need to have shorter interparticle spacing and longer precipitate a uh, uh, larger uh, precipitate so in fact it is quite interesting let us look at the effect of texture on creep and uh, so, by this uh, in fact nickel based super alloys are very effective uh, high temperature materials and in fact the initial super alloy they were polycrystalline. In polycrystalline the failure takes place through cavitation and these are the grain boundaries are the site where cavitation takes place and particularly the grain boundary where the load is tensile this is the tensile load. So, these are the grain boundaries where cavitation takes place and because of that the effective strength decreases and they have poor creep property. Now, correspondingly if you try to avoid these types of grain boundaries say if you directionally solidify then grain boundaries are aligned. In that case you have minimum amount of grain boundary perpendicular to the direction of stress. In that case found a directionally solidified alloy you have fewer uh, cavity sites. Uh, I mean fewer sites where cavity can nucleate under tension. So, therefore, they are likely to give better creep resistance and in extreme case you have a single crystal have do not have any grain boundary, but again we need to have precipitate. So, what do you have is nickel based super alloy you have gamma prime and these gamma prime precipitates are coherent precipitate, coherent precipitates have low surface energy they are highly stable they do not grow at uh, I mean growth rate is minimal and so therefore, they have high structural stability and you have large volume fraction of precipitate, but the overall structure it is a single crystals there is no high angle grain boundary. So, they exhibit very good creep resistance in fact, cast single crystal super alloy blades they have excellent creep resistance and many aero gas turbine even some new generation of power. Mm, you know, these uh, um, land based turbines are also uh, I mean uh, these are the potential materials to be exploited. But this directional solidification and quick look I mean this I have just named. Uh, so, this is a because they cannot be deformed. So, the material when you make the product it should be near net shape product and uh, this is done by precision casting and loss to x process on investment casting these are the technique and this is the cube direction is the preferred direction of growth. This is the direction growth rate is maximum and often this is also direction which has low modulus and in fact, they have better thermal fatigue resistance and many super alloy we also find this is the direction which has very high creep resistance. So, therefore, um, and in nickel based super alloy this is the preferred direction that we want and the reason for good uh, creep resistance is absence of potential site for cavitation. 
and this diagram gives a how the super alloy evolved over a span of just 50, 60 years and here only you know our understanding of the physical principle of the transformation and physical metallurgy was been primarily responsible in extending the temperature capability which was around just around the world war time when this gas turbine was developed and that is the time the initial blade material were made up of wrought alloy and the temperature was around this and today this uh, turbine blade temperature can go as high as around 1000 degree centigrade and it is the single crystal blade uh, which can withstand this. So, in fact, this did not happen uh, just in a I mean increment there has been incremental development wrought alloy also temperature capability by alloying addition making creep difficult uh, it was possible to increase it substantially then came conventional casting because if you increase the creep resistance too much these material are difficult to deform. So, then all the alternative is conventionally cast the precision casting techniques and then but these are still uh, polycrystalline material. Then this directional solidification developed around 60s and from late uh, mid 70s the single crystal blades uh, became available and they are currently is the most uh, attractive material for aerogas turbine. And these are actually uh, the alloy elements have uh, a quick look uh, which you can consider as a summary. You have certain alloy element which are present in solid solutions and they are called solid solution or matrix strengthener and these are the elements chromium, cobalt, moly, tungsten. Whereas, you also need to have precipitate some of these modern uh, uh, turbine blades they have 70 percent gamma prime these are the hard phase gamma prime former and these gamma prime precipitates are pr primarily Ni 3 Al or Ni 3 Ti uh, or uh, it, it can also niobium and tantalum also uh, is a similar type of precipitates forms and they are coherent precipitates. In case of polycrystalline material you need to have grain boundary strengthener. Normally in the grain boundary strengthener they segregate in the grain boundary and grain boundary if alloy content is higher they have higher strength. So, segregation actually is the key uh, the grain boundary strengthener. So, these are the grain boundary strengthener. You also have some carbide formers and this carbides also will be present near the grain boundary and they will also strengthen the grain boundary. And we also need good oxidation resistance. So, these are chromium and aluminum they, they help develop a protective oxide scale on the thin oxide scale on the blade material and this prolongs its life. And in fact, if you go for single crystal variety then many of these need not be added like grain boundary strengthener you do not need. But you need to increase its capability you possibly need certain elements which have very high melting point they are often added like rhenium to increase the solvers temperature or the melting temperature. So, in short you can say the single crystal variety uh, does not need grain boundary. So, they are actually linear alloys. And let us now look at another uh, exploitation of this preferred orientation is in case of uh, electrical applications. Now, electrical applications see one type of application is when a, wherever you know like transformer these are stationary parts. So, here you need a texture uh, material because iron if it develops this kind of a texture then this, this is the direction in which it magnetizes very easily and this is a preferred texture and in fact if this is so then this type of material uh, uh, will be have a uh, exhibit a good soft magnetic property which is required in transformer. It should have and in fact uh, this is a BH loop which is and the area of this BH loop is a measure of hysteresis and this gives a, a amount of the heat that is generated during uh, uh, in a transformer. This can give an idea about the heat and if you have a soft magnetic material with a minimum Mm, minimum the hysteresis loss that will be ideal and this is possible by uh, you know controlling 
the texture. If you try to develop this type of texture, this will be minimum. And also, there is another way of uh, improving uh, uh, cutting down that, um, that heat generation is uh, the current that which is induced that eddy current and which is done by alloying. And usually, uh, this is the BH plot that initial permeability is important, it must have high permeability. The slope is the permeability. So, this is 3.5 percent silicon grain oriented. So, this is a textured material. So, here texture is preferable in transformer because they are static, they are not rotating. Whereas, other extreme in rotors, you know, it rotates. So, here the steel on which that winding is made you know it should not have preferred orientation is not desirable. So, you try to have non oriented sheet here. So, here you need an isotropic material whereas, here you need an anisotropic material. And so, these are the thing in this particular case obviously, you will making a sacrifice the mu is low. And if it is high carbon steel or cast iron they even have they are actually preferred as a high carbon steels they are preferred as a permanent magnet. So, soft magnet say like for transformer application you need high mu low hysteresis and whereas, rotor also you need high mu. So, you add you do add silicon and you have a better mu here, but point is uh, you need random orientation that non oriented sheet in this particular case and magnetically soft alloy here if it is have this kind of a texture, this is the parallel to the rolling direction and this is obtained by controlling the processing. And in fact, if you look at the processing of that recrystallization of cold work structure, if you recollect for uh, low carbon steel, you may some of the steel you may have a little uh, low carbon steel. This is a typical annealing plot and now when you anneal, the hardness initially may increase a bit, but later on it decreases. This is a strain aging part, but uh, let us forget this part here and primary when this recrystallization takes place new strain free grains form. And after a certain stage uh, you know if this press you, you go on increasing the temperature beyond a certain temperature this precipitates whatever or inclusions whatever are there you know if they dissolve and that is the time there will be uncontrolled grain growth and this is called secondary recrystallization. And during that time what happened this will be the initial grain size distribution d is the grain diameter and usually grain size distribution in an anneal structure you have a log normal kind of a distribution this is the frequency you have that certain number of grains if this is say for this diameter this is the frequency. So, many grains have this is diameter, so many grains have this diameter. And when the secondary recrystallization sets in, suddenly you find a bimodal kind of distribution. And towards the end, what happened? This finally will disappear and you will have a large grain. This is the kind. And this secondary recrystallization texture, this is the Gauss structure texture, which is uh, 110. And here, this is the soft uh, magnetic axis. So, therefore, by secondary recrystallization, you can develop steel which is ideal for uh, transformer applications. So, this is where it is preferred. So, therefore, what we looked at today, just to sum up, we looked at an isotropy. An isotropy in certain cases, it can be exploited, it is advantageous. We looked at texture hardening and we looked at its limited scope in cubic structures, but in certain hexagonal closed pack structures it is possibly it can be exploited. We looked at origin of an isotropy. We looked at certain other applications like where an isotropy is required. So, in case of a formability is an example where you need planar isotropy. isotropy, but through thickness anisotropy. 
So, here you need a special texture to be developed in the material. We also looked at super alloy, this is the high temperature material, textured material have better grip resistance. When you have this uh, nickel based super alloy, if you have 110 direction as the direction tensile direction, then you have better creep resistance and this is uh, obtained by, this is primarily obtained by uh, controlling the solidification process through directional solidification. Uh, we also looked at electrical steel and we looked at how this structure can be developed by controlling decrystallizations. By controlling the decrystallization is the key thing whether you have this precipitate or you do not have the precipitate, you get different kinds of texture and this is the key to develop application steels for either electrical applications or formable variety of steel. So, with this we cover uh, this chapter on uh, application of preferred orientation or texture material where and we just seen certain cases it is advantageous and where it is advantageous, what is the method of developing the desired structure. Uh, with this we finish this topic uh, and next class uh, we will take up a new topic. Thank you very much.